Good morning. Hi there. Good morning, everyone. Hello there, James. Welcome, everybody. It's the FPGA and Remote Labs meetup for the 29th of November, 2022. And what we do here at this meeting is talk about what we've done over the past week, uh, what we are planning to do over the next week, what kind of things we need in order to do this work, and um, if we have any roadblocks, anything that's that's kind of blocking our way. And I will uh, turn it over to James to give a brief report. I have not coordinated the move moving of the lab equipment yet, um, but I will really soon. Um, so just just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, but but anyway, you have the floor because uh, I know that you have some classes to get to. Thank you, Michelle. You have to excuse me just one moment. Apologies for that. Uh, my dog saw a truck go down across the street and that he decided that the, that the entire household needed to be alerted. Um, uh, we're doing fairly well. We're continuing our work in moving things up and preparing things around. Uh, only roadblock lately has been the weather has been less cooperative to some of our work. Nothing that would damage any of the equipment. It's just been more rainy uh, recently. But we're still getting more work done, and we're not in terrible need of assistance currently. Awesome. Thank you. I should have some some more information for you over the next week now that we're back from from all the Thanksgiving festivi festivities uh, here in the, the U.S., uh, kind of a big holiday. So thank you so much. Okay. And um, Ever Reese, do you have the you have the floor? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm oh, sorry. My mic. Okay. Um, just a quick update of uh, what I did. Uh, I mainly played with uh, DVBGSC, and I uh, use right now the uh, disencapsulator from uh, Dan EA4 GPZ. Uh, who has uh, developed uh, uh, BB, uh, BB frame to uh, IP. Uh, they fragment uh, the DBBGAC uh, in uh, the Rust language. So it's a good start. Uh, I set up a new tech EL170. Uh, which is a uh, DVBGS encapsulator professional. And uh, I try to uh, study if there is some corner cases and uh, want to uh, well understand all the, all the protocol before uh, implementing it on the modulator. Well, that's it. Well, that's a lot. Thank you so much. It's extremely <laughs> exciting. Yeah, and wait for all the good news from the Cubs. Well, I think we have some things to share there, so I'll turn it over to, to Paul. Okay, we have been working on the Cubs decoder, uh, making good progress. I think we have a lot of the behaviors are nailed down now. Uh, we're at the point where we need more automated testing, and we're almost ready to, to start running a bunch of that. I've created a an automated test vector generator program. It's a yet another Jupyter notebook in Python, and a, a second Python notebook that takes the output from the simulation and uh, checks to see whether the decoded frames are the same ones we use to generate the test vectors. Um, that was completed last night and is ready to have its first test um, anytime now, so maybe today. And then we'll be ready to uh, turn up the number of frames per test. And uh, this is kind of a, a big milestone for the Cobbs decoder. If it passes a bunch of randomly generated tests with handshake signals being stressed, then it'll be ready to move on to the next step, which would be integrating it into with the actual decoder in the uh, or maybe with some axi blocks for a further exercise before we integrate it. We haven't decided what, which path to take on that. 
Um, but there we are. We're uh, just about ready. This Cobbs has been kind of a diversion from from the mainstream of of getting things tested for the decoder, but I think it'll make actual testing the decoder uh, much less frustrating and more automatable and more reliable. And uh, so it's been worth it. And it's been very fun that we learned a lot about uh, the HDL and testing and Axie and all that stuff that's in there. So that's where it's at. Um, while I've got the floor, I'll mention there's nothing much to say about the remote lab here. It's uh, cranking along. Oh, one thing um, we discovered, <laughs> Michelle discovered that uh, if you leave your SSH keys lying around on GitHub for a year without using them to log on to GitHub, then and GitHub expires them. And this is a potential problem for the remote lab because we use the SSH keys stored on GitHub to uh, authenticate access to the Vivado floating license. Now, the good news is that it, when GitHub expires your SSH key, that doesn't break the floating license login immediately. <laughs> um, but it means if you ever update SSH keys there and, and notify us here at the remote lab, either Nick or myself, that um, that you need to update the keys, then all the keys that were there before will be wiped out as part of the update if they've been expired by GitHub. So I added a few words about this to the document on working with FPGAs for the future. But if anybody uh, ends up needing to solve this problem, then we know what's going on and we can help. Um, hopefully we'll get in the get in the loop and and stop anybody from making a, a damaging update. So otherwise, nothing to report from the remote lab. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a it was an interesting experience to not be able to check out the license. What what it what it looked like was that synthesis failed uh, over on Karapi for some HDL coder work. Uh, so what we'd like to do is take uh, Fred Harris's really wonderful polyphase channelizer work that's in MATLAB and convert that into VHDL, human readable VHDL using the tools that we currently have access to. And so uh, learning how to do HDL coder uh, revealed that the, the floating license couldn't be assigned uh, because my keys had expired. So anybody that got, got involved with remote lab around the same time that I did, this is probably something that um, that will happen to you, um, but if you're if you're just using the same VM that you've always used, then then you won't notice right away. So the the reason why it was obvious to me was because I was using a different VM. So hey, ne there's never <laughs> a shortage of things to learn about remote work and access and the internet. So it was uh, we got it under control. Uh, but but just a heads up to anybody that wants to use remote labs, uh, the way that we do it is with SSH keys on GitHub, and if those aren't used to log into GitHub, then they don't consider it to be active and they'll expire them in a year. With the HDL coder stuff, there's a lot going on there, so we're trying to take full advantage of what the of that tool uh, to produce as much work as possible. Um, and it's it's a very powerful tool. What I'm I'm doing uh, on for on my end is uh, trying to get a class with a uh, with Adam Taylor, who does a lot of FPGA classes, um, and trying to put together a class for the open source community that addresses space, uh, you know, working uh, VHDL and, and other FPGA work for space applications because we need higher reliability. And there are some concerns and some things that you can do uh, in your approach to FPGA work to make it more reliable. So I think this would be a great class for us to to support and try to develop. And so that's we're in the initial stages of trying to work that out and and trying to bring that to the open community. This is a class that that he does uh, for companies uh, currently. So it's not new uh, content for him. It's just it hasn't ever been offered to the open source community before. Uh, so so I'll. I'll work as hard as I can to make that happen and and get it up and running as, as quickly as possible. Um, we'll be doing some travel uh, in mid-December, early mid-December. So I'll be gone from the 6th through the 9th of December to Washington, DC 
for this is for the FCC TAC meeting that is the end of the year and we'll be presenting our final reports and talking to all sorts of different people about open source and amateur radio. It's been a really good experience and there's a report about that on our homepage. All right, and then I'll hand it over to Sasha who you have the floor. She says her microphone isn't working. Now you're muted. Yes, now I'm muted. It's the song of our people. Okay, no, we are, we have uh, another resource for uh, layout. So if you're interested in RF layout, we have at least one other person who's available that's uh, spinning, they're spinning up to do it. Uh, so that's the good news for you. And uh, just looking for any any way to help. Anybody with I, the, I think my mic works now. Oh, go ahead. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. I was on another device with more flaky hardware. <laughs> so yeah, I actually, I bought some, some receiving hardware last week. So I bought the two the two cards that were in the GitHub repo. And I also bought, uh, I think, I don't remember the exact name, but one of the, the mini tuner, the one that like was available on that store that I could just buy like pre-made because I, I'm not up for an adventure with getting that soldered. <laughs> so that is, all of that is on the way and I'm going to be looking, I'm going to finish up looking at parts for like all the all the up converter parts so like local oscillator frequency sense frequency sen fr frequency synthesizer if i can pronounce correctly and also like the mixer and all of that i'm not going to look at the power amplifier this time around and yeah i think yeah also another thing i'm going to do is i'm going to try and try and find a a way to down convert it just so I can test it with a with a receiver that because all of them take L band and not X band. And yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try and ask my try and ask my client to see if if they're willing to expense a spectrum analyzer rental just so I can like directly see the spectrum. And if not, I'm just going to I'm just going to get a I'm just going to use another down converter to to, to look at the spectrum at a lower frequency and try and compensate for the <laughs> second down conversion. But yeah, or or maybe yeah, see if I have a, a friend who has a higher bandwidth spectrum analyzer, I think. But yeah, that's kind of my plan. Oh yeah, I was wondering who was the other person you mentioned that was involved with like the RF layout stuff? Yeah, the layout, yeah, the layout, person, layout person, that's person that's involved and wants to help, wants is, to help Keith is Keith Wheeler. Keith Wheeler. Okay. Can you? Can oh, you sorry. You can also. Oh, sorry. You yeah, can I also, will. Yeah, I will. You can also you use can anything also use that's in remote labs. That's in remote labs. Yeah. In terms of, in test, terms equipment. of test equipment. Yeah. Yeah. The the issue is is just getting the physical signal there, because, like it, the, we're we're fit, because like if I have some dev boards that are doing like X band up that have X band, then it would be a bit like difficult for me to get the expand signal to somewhere where I can analyze it so that like that would that would be the issue <laughs> if I yeah I I mean is the, would there be a way like short of just like sending stuff over <laughs> well Paul do, Paul do you want to address the capabilities, address the capabilities of remote lab, of remote lab? I'm not sure I understand the test scenario you have in mind that obviously, yes, obviously you magically you have signals, have signals across across between, between one lab and another. Lab and another. Um, um, if there's a way to a capture way. In place and play back here at the lab, we can attempt to do that. Um, all the details are going to have to be figured out. Um, so if you can describe your scenario, then I'll try to pay attention this time and maybe I can understand what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I, the thing I'm, I'm, the thing I was wondering is I, I, I want to test up, I want to test up conversion 
to expand. So either like let's say 10 gigahertz notional eight. And I want to look at what what the output of the what the output of the up converter looks like to, in the spectrum analyzer to make sure that there aren't that like the spectral purity is good enough and is not going to like get the regulators angry at us because we won't need the emissions map. And okay. I I don't have a I don't have a spectrum analyzer that goes that high is the issue. Well, as it turns out, we don't either. Um, okay. The spectrum so analyzer that, tops out at six gigahertz. gigahertz. And to get spectral purity on a 10 gigahertz up converter, you need a 100 gigahertz spectrum analyzer, if you're interested in harmonics anyway. Um, yeah. This is beyond the capability of the remote lab, even if you were physically okay. present here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so maybe the right answer the is, right to, answer look is to look rental. into a rental. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for harmonics, like we can just put a low pass filter. I was more thinking of like our like side bands, like like the signal is going to nominally take up like whatever 10, 10 megahertz or whatever. But I was I was just wanting to make sure that like past the past like that it means like the emission masks. Okay, but, so you're still outside the capability since our spectrum analyzer tops out at six. Yeah, we would need a down converter to do that here, or else uh, temporary access to, to your spectrum yeah. analyzer. Yeah, so I think I, I think I'm just going to go with like a a top uh, like a top notch mixer and a local oscillator, just just to do a good down conversion that doesn't introduce additional additional distortion. So. Yeah, I good think idea. That's yeah. Good. That sounds like a reasonable that's point. Right. So that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. And we'll probably seek to duplicate your solution here in the remote lab in case other people yeah. will do the same okay. test. And I do have two Plutos to to generate the signal and also to use as the general SDR to look at. Signal. So yeah, that's it's good that y'all y'all have it working on the Pluto <laughs> just so I can use that without too much trouble. So yeah. Definitely looking forward to getting everything working with that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Special thanks to Everest for all of the amazing work on the Pluto. Yeah, that's kind of it for me i don't have much else i'm kind of guy kind of split between like ordering hardware for personal for myself and also looking looking at parts trying to figure out how i'm going to do testing stuff yeah well it's plenty you're, you're doing quite a bit it's deeply appreciated i'm looking forward to to publishing uh, all that we, all can, we and can and helping move things forward thanks Okay, and there's tons of other stuff going on. Um, so we'll we'll meet back up on Slack, uh, and I'll I'll turn it over to anybody that has any final comments or questions, concerns, needs resources, any anything at all. Cool. Okay. Let's see. I think we'll we'll meet it again in a week. Uh, just, oh, go ahead. Uh, just a uh, quick question. Um, I, I have to review the, uh, I can't remember if, if it is the downstream or the upstream, uh, which means um, on the modulator, uh, what is planned to do? Is it a multiple uh, input stream? Uh, which means uh, there is several stream in the DVBS2, DVBGAC, or is it only some mod code which is changing uh, depending on the on the efficiency link? Um, where 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 can I uh, find this document uh, which describe uh, what exactly we need? Uh, on the DVBS2 encoder and what 
is the dynamic, well, what the, par the parameters, uh, well, what could be dynamic, which means, um, is it just the mod code, which is uh, adapt from, uh, from the link? If the link is not enough, then <clears throat> we can uh, increase the FEC or uh, do we need multiple uh, stream in the same uh, in the same modulation? Um, is there a document on that? I, I can I hardly find it. Yes, there yeah. is an article about uh, adaptive coding and modulation the way that we uh, want to do it. Um, and this yeah. was in um, AMSAT DL uh, journal a while back. And I can share that uh, with you. It's it's in the repo, but it's kind of sprawling. Everything's a little spread yeah, out. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I, uh... No, no, it's, it's our it's our fault. It's 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 yeah. not uh, easy to find everything uh, when okay. you want to find it. So we 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 published an article a couple of years ago about ACM and how we wanted to okay. do it. And yes, it's exactly like what you've said. So the what we're doing is we're looking at the link quality. And if you yeah. need a better mod cod, then we give it to you. And then what we do on the transponder is that everybody that that uh, is the same type of mod cod goes into that particular frame. Uh, so there's some multiplexing that we're doing uh, and quality of service decisions that we're making, but it's it's to give um, you know the best performance possible based on the challenges that people have with the, with the link quality based on SNR. So so. Pretty straightforward ACM is what we're, okay. we're thinking about. And, and it, what we'll do to implement that for an end-to-end -end test, so getting the encoder working, you know, getting the transmitter working is one part of it, and getting the uplink uh, working, and then deciding how to put that information into the downlink. All of that is is very important. Um, so, yeah. so it's pretty straightforward ACM to start out, where okay. based and on... What and have you uh, already choose uh, the the well the feedback? Uh, what what is the the method of the written um, well if a client uh, has <clears throat> has not enough ACNR because he has a little uh, dish for example? Yeah. Uh, how how he send it to uh, to the transmitter? Is yes. It RCS or another protocol? The uplink is uh, a, a dedicated protocol. So the uplink is opulent voice uh, protocol. And then the downlink, of course, is uh, DVB S2. So the-, the Yeah, but, but for, the, for the quality, which means uh, how SN do you- Yeah, the SNR, okay. Uh, there is a client which has a little SNR and want to uh, uh, have a more robust uh, mod code. How is how it he send it to uh, to the transponder? Is it by uh, by the, the protocol? The protocol. Sorry, the protocol you mentioned. Um, well, maybe maybe it is described on the document, so uh, uh, I can read it and uh, and be more comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's based on SNR, so we want to support all different types of uh, stations. So a station that has like a small dish or a station that has a large dish, but it happens to have a pointing error is in the same trouble, right? Yeah. You know, low SNR. And what we want is the link to adapt to that, to give you the best possible way to complete the link. Um, so yeah, I'll send, send you the document and and it's also in the, the main architecture document, but not, um, you know, it's mentioned in the the uh, in our architecture. Uh, but yeah, I'll send that send that to you. It's a uh, the the first first step for us for end to end is to is to get anything working. You know, so a fixed mod cod yeah. would would be the yeah. first thing. That's what kind of what we're working with now. So uh, and later on uh, with with all of with everybody helping then we add in the functionality that, that looks at signal to noise ratio and then says, oh, you need this mod cod in order to close the link. In the in the article for AMSAT DL uh, journal, we picked a subset. So we we picked high points across the 
the whole spectrum, the five different mod CODs and said, okay, this is good enough to start out with. So instead of supporting every single solitary mod COD, uh, I think we picked out like five and, and said, okay, mm -hmm. so, so this would be a good place to start. So it gives you very low SNR all the way up to pretty good SNR for an amateur station. Um, and, and if you do those, then you can see that the difference between them is a reasonable dB jump in SNR. And it will keep yeah. you from, from uh, vacillating, from oscillating back and forth, which is, can be a problem with ACM where if it, the steps are too small, then it, it, you know, it wanders around and, and you have a lot of extra frames. Uh, so, so we want the resolution to be uh, appropriate for our particular um, application. And we may not know <laughs> until we actually get some, some real world experience, uh, mm -hmm. how, how many, how many different levels are going to work well for us. Uh, you know, cause we don't want to have empty sets of frames going out. Um, and we also don't want to make people wait and lose lose lock or signal. So so these things are system design decisions that need to be made uh, with some, some real world experience. Um, and if anybody else has a comment about it, um, please speak up. Like looking at Paul, if you have any comments about this particular challenge uh, with your experience in communication systems. Well, a couple. Um... One is I, I don't think that the details that you may be looking for every have actually been written down uh, packet formats and protocols and exactly what the procedures are for getting this ACM to work. Um, we have ideas and intentions, but not a detailed design at this point that I, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, we uh, only we only have like the SNR levels to switch between the different mod CODs, you know, so a table essentially like for this for this level of SNR, use this mod cod, and for this, use that. And that's as far as we've gotten so far, because uh, without an actual end-to-end -end system working, that's really as far as you can go. Uh, you can design something that's very complicated or very simple, but when you when you actually start transmitting and, and with real delay and real latency and real complexity, that's when you have to go ahead and commit to the particular uh, details, so. Okay, uh, so, as far as I understand, the, uh, the, the, the stream is the same mod code for everyone, which means that there is no multiple uh, input stream uh, because it's possible in DPBS2. Uh, like, for example, this stream is a QS. Uh, well, depending on the QS, you can, you can have a mod code for uh, high priority. Uh, well, in, in, uh, uh, just thinking that uh, this uh, particular um, content is very important, so uh, you you will uh, try some mod code uh, with a lot of uh, check error. And on the other way, uh, uh, you need more bandwidth, but there is less error. So there is multiple stream on that, and mm -hmm. there is different mod code. Yeah, we, yeah, that's what we intend to provide is every frame on the downlink can be a different mod cod depending on where it's going and what quality of service it's assigned, you know, so okay. what we what we've talked about a couple of times uh, is that if there's if the capacity of the system is not full, if you have and you know it's a fairly large capacity system that we're talking about let's say the capacity of the system is 100 simultaneous users and you only have 30, then you can give them all maximum coding and modulation. You can make sure that, that even the smallest station can receive everything. And then as you, if you filled, started filling it up, then you'd have to start making some decisions about who gets what and when. So some people may only get um, certain amounts of traffic uh, if it was really, really full. So we would like to make sure that everybody can hear everything as much as possible. And beyond that, you would have to start making these sorts of decisions to where, okay, now we have to make sure that the smaller stations with a smaller dish or with a pointing error or with bad weather, for instance, if we have a, a downlink at 10 gig or 24 gig, weather really affects those 
paths and you would have to adapt to that particular uh, path with, you know, weather moves in and you have to ratchet up your modulation and coding for that particular station. So you'd make sure that they got the traffic uh, that they, they knew that they wanted um, at a particular mod cod. So because we can change per frame, it gives us some flexibility there. Um, but I think that unless you're pushed, unless the system has to start making those decisions, that it should simply make sure that everybody can hear everything as much as possible. So, you know, in the amateur tradition. Yeah, we have to grapple with the fact that it's fundamentally a broadcast medium on the downlink. And we, we want to preserve that. The amateur, especially for voice conversation, but in, for everything in general, um, tradition is for everybody to hear everybody. So there might be tiers of service. For instance, you might say that, okay, all voice is going to be transmitted at a certain mod cod. And if you want to be able to receive that, you better have a reliable ground station at that dish size to be able to receive that. In that way, you'd be able to dial in whatever voice uh, conversation was going on. And I, I think that's reasonable for a, a certain um, type of service, which is the primary one for ham radio uses, uh, where everybody might want to dial into any conversation. But we also want to support um, higher bit rate applications, which might not be compatible with every ground station. And then it starts to get closer to the point to point case where you can actually use a closed loop ACM. Um, for the for voice, I think we're probably aiming, in my opinion, anyway, we're aiming at something a little bit less than ACM because we can't close the loop because we want not only everybody in the conversation, but everybody monitoring the conversation to be able to hear. And they can't all be giving continuous feedback to the satellite. This, that would be um, probably impractical and certainly inefficient. So uh, I think there are a lot of details here that, that need to be figured out. And we want to keep in mind what the use case is for the for the actual users and make it a pleasant experience for, for the majority of people who have lesser equipment uh, to be able to have conversations, preferably yeah. multi-way conversations, preferably right. with anybody without prior arrangement. Yeah. And it, it, people with weather, you know, weather conditions, environmental conditions, uh, equipment conditions, pointing, all of these things can affect the, the reception and transmission. Yeah. And if, if you're in a disadvantaged location or you're disadvantaged, uh, you know, you got weather above you that, that causes a disadvantage, maybe that's just too bad. <laughs> uh, we can't possibly cl close every link. Um, yeah, but we can try because ACM is so neat. So we can make it as automated as possible and then be smart about the overall system design that it's, it's going to try to prioritize communications as much as possible and then start spreading people out, you know, like, okay, your station is now uh, capable of maybe text or, or file, you know, slow file transmission, but voice may drop out for you if, if enough people are on board. And this is, in, in some sense, this is uh, superior because you, you're going to have more people being able to use it than would use it without uh, the, the digital um, error correction, so... These you are all things that we've talked that. about for a while, you know, so, so but we, we're only now getting to the point where we're able to start writing the code or, or making the decisions based on the actual um, hardware uh, achievement. So the hardware being capable of doing this stuff then allows these ideas to be tested. Um, so, so far they're just ideas and pseudocode and, and some papers. And now it's very exciting because we, as soon as we have hardware that's capable of transmitting and 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 doing a ACM, you know, having this this mod cod word at the start of a BB frame is very powerful. Now this can go out over the air. Okay, great. Now we can start testing these ideas about ACM for amateur communications. Yeah. Okay. Thanks yeah. for all the details. Of I course. Think that <laughs> I think that more and more we uh, go forward, then we we need to uh, well some some details uh, before is well 
we, we need more and more uh, details on that because uh, I, I understand the, the, the global strategy, but um, as soon as, uh, well, I, I begin to uh, well, try to uh, uh, send different mod codes and uh, try now uh, IP DVGB, DVB GAC, uh, there is a lot of strategy to, um, to achieve on that. That's right. <laughs> exactly right. We're with you 100%. I could not agree more. <laughs> yep, now is the time to, to get this stuff working. So it's very exciting. I'm, I'm super happy because we've been wanting to do this for so long. And having hardware capable of doing it over the air is really necessary. So... We'll, uh, we'll do all that we can to answer all the questions and put out uh, actual designs instead of just desires and, and you know, architectures and high level talk. That's great. And you have to do that part. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, real, the real thing is the working code that implements it over the air, to me anyway. <laughs> That's my, yeah. my opinion. That's what's most important. So we're going to yeah, work yeah. as hard as we can to get that uh, up and running as soon as possible. So as soon as I understand all the all the the, the uh, all the strategy is done in the transponder, so on the satellite itself, right? Yeah. Um, the, the the maybe your first step is to uh, have this strategy on the ground station, uh, on an uplink ground station. Um, uh, well, if if I'd like to test it, uh, for example, on Q Q100, um, then uh, I try to uh, well maybe get some uh, uplink uh, from the satellite, then receive all that, and then uplink uh, the DBBS2, and which could be received, which means that. It's a simulation of the um, of an automatic transponder that's it's on the on the ground, so it's easier to test. Yeah. Okay. That's a excellent idea. I understand. All right. We'll we'll keep working. <laughs> yeah. We, we have lots to do. I'm very excited. So it's a. Uh... It's wonderful, wonderful news. So I really appreciate your time and your expertise, Everest. Um, no problem. And I'll will send out the the article and and um, all the okay, links great. that I have to the to you and the and also the list so that everybody can see what we're talking about. Okay. Cool. Okay. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Okay, we'll do this again. Let's see. Today is November 29th. I'm looking at the calendar here. Okay, so yeah, a week from today, I'm not going to be here. We'll be flying. So yeah, we might not have the meeting next week because we'll be traveling to um, Washington, D.C. for the FCC meeting. So just keep an eye out on Slack. I might have Steve Conklin or one of the other, or Keith Wheeler might, might be able to host um, since... He's going to be instrumental in board layout for a, well, we're, we're hoping for a low cost version of an SDR that might uh, work for, uh, for ground stations. So, so keep an eye out for that. I'll make, try to make sure that that's set up. And if not, then we'll see you in two weeks and we'll have uh, plenty to report from, from the FCC. A lot to feedback on the work that we've do, been doing over the past year on open source advocacy uh, in the regulatory process. All right, thanks everybody. See you on Slack. Bye-bye.